Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. James Smith Jr. and welcome to another edition of the Dr. James Show. And I, I'm kind of giddy. I feel like it's Christmas in November. Why? Because of our guest, Billy Weishus Johnson. Let me read a few stats before Billy comes on. In college, Widener University, where I attended, it was Widener College at the time, 62 touchdowns, 30, over 3,700 yards rushing, over 5,400 5, yards all purpose, uh, all American, 72 and 73, broke nine NAACP, NCAA, excuse me, NCAA records, 22 Widener records. And while he was at Widener, he scored a touchdown in 27 out of 28 games. He went on to the pros where he spent 15 years playing for the Houston Oilers, Atlanta Falcons. He played one year in Canada. He's on the NFL's 75th anniversary team as one of the top 75 players ever. Welcome to the show, Billy White Shoes Johnson. What's up? What's up, Paul Lefamer? What's up, Bill? How you doing, my friend? Hey, I'm doing well. I am doing extremely well. Life is worth living, and I'm just glad to be alive. Man, you look like you can still get out there and juke a little bit. No, like I told you before, I perpetrate a fraud, so <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can do. I can talk a good game now. I hear you. I hear you. Well, rather than me at this point going through all your moves and, and your jukes and your funky chicken, let's take a look at Billy in action. Let's take a look. Just plain flashy. The number three return ace of all time, Billy White Shoes Johnson. Billy White Shoes Johnson, he was the first of the great return men in the NFL. You want us to go after it, you want to return. 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 Billy Johnson will feel this one. He was the first returner to develop a strong identity. Billy White Shoes. White Shoes. White Shoes? A little fella they call Billy White Shoes. You have to have a nickname. I mean, that adds to it. He was wearing the low-cut white shoes, which he probably painted himself because I don't even think they were selling white shoes in stores. It perked your attention because you'd never seen that before. It was something that was fresh. It was something new. Nobody had seen anything like him. Billy Johnson, here he goes again. Billy Johnson across midfield. He's still on his feet. Nobody knew who Billy was, but it didn't take him long because he was an instant hit. An electrifying return by Billy White Shoes Johnson. He was a little small guy. He was about 5'9". You couldn't catch him. Little number 84, Billy Johnson, a slippery escape artist who can turn a simple punt return into a geometry lesson. Best way to describe it is trying to catch a hummingbird or maybe a lightning bug because Billy was everywhere. Whenever I get the ball, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> What I'm going to do. I know where I'm supposed to go. I don't think half the time the guys blocking for him, they knew where he was going. He didn't just get the ball and go. He moved, he'd reverse his field, he'd come back. If he goes to the right, don't chase him because he'll be coming back. <laughs> Johnson at the 30, 20, touchdown, Billy Johnson. Somebody said he could stop on a dime and he could leave you change. He had that juke, if you will, that he, the first guy missed, and then he was off to the races. You were just chasing his shadows. Johnson off to the races down the sideline. He's still on his feet. When he'd get his hands on the ball on the point, everybody stand up. He never hesitated. On his first step, he's going full speed. <laughs> well, well, it takes bum, you back bum a bit. Lost <laughs> bum lost it, huh? <laughs> oh man, yeah, yeah. I didn't know until you come to the sideline until I saw the uh, the uh, film uh, clip of it. So, but yeah, he's he, most of the time he's a kind of reserved guy. But we needed that win though, so that's why <laughs> I'm sure he was rather uh, animated. Billy, how, how do you feel watching that just now? Watching you do what you did back then. <laughs> You know, Doc, it's, it's, it's a lot of memories, to be honest with you. You, know, you look at the film and you see the guys uh, blocking for me. And that's where we were. I mean, it was so simple for me because the only time I would really fair catch is if you yelled and it was up to me to catch the ball or, or, and take it or fair catch it. 
But look at the blocks. You know, you might see me focusing on me running, but look at the blocks that were there. Some guys made two or three different blocks because I came back and ran in circles. <laughs> but, but it was good feeling because everybody enjoyed uh, enjoyed being out there on a return team. And it was just one collective effort. And, and it felt good that guys, because normally at that time, oh, I got to go out here and block for the punt, for the uh, punt returner. But they were enthusiastic. They were just as willing to get out there and participate in that on that return team as I was to return it. And that's what made it fun. Made it fun. T tell us about how difficult it was to catch the punt. You made it look simple. I returned punts in high school and college, and it was hard. <laughs> you made it look simple. Did you have a formula? Did you I mean? It was It, it was just easy. simple. Um, it was, I, it, I guess you can call it formula, but you always go back, sit up quick, square it away, make it come down, you know, the middle of your body, and, and don't. Everybody always wants to teach the elbows together. It's just like a baseball player. You know, you feel that you get down and get your legs under you. That was simple to me. Having played baseball all the years in Little League and in Tino League and uh, things like that, that was easy. And I never thought of it as a chore. It was just another chance for me to get the ball in my hands and, and, and run with it. So any chance you got at my size to get the ball in your hands to run with it, you would do that and kickoffs and, of course, playing the receiver, uh, inside receiver also. That's awesome, awesome. Billy, I'm going to put a picture up there. I want you to tell me about Billy White Shoes Johnson at that age. Let's take a look at the picture and <laughs> tell me about that Billy then. Let's take a look. Tell me about that Billy. I see Widener, 46. Tell us <laughs> yeah. about that Billy. That was the, um, oh gosh, beginning of my career. Um, Ooh, let's go back. You can tell by the fro that uh, <laughs> they, they didn't have those combs or picks. They were just beginning at that time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I remember that well. I think we had just changed our names to Widener. Uh, and I, I remember that well. Richie Weaver, uh, mm -hmm. Larry McGuire, and all of us just... Uh, making a name for Widener itself. I mean, we didn't know what to think of it because I came in under PMC. That's right. And uh, remember that. So uh, it's one of, it was really a beginning. And it was the beginning for, I guess, that um, era of dominance with Coach Manlove. Uh, and he was, and he was, I, I look at that and I think of Coach Manlove uh, got me to go to Widener and it was the beginning of, of, of his career. And, and it's all, It'll be many victories they had at that time. I would contribute all that to him. Uh, he was the beginning of it all. And I think that's why it had the sustenance because of him. Yeah, yeah I, I remember you coming on campus um, after, you know, your, not after, your, during your pro career. And um, that's to visit the team. And when I saw you, and you were the reason I thought, I can play in the pros. I was wrong, but <laughs> the division three players don't typically make the pros, but you did. And I thought I could. How'd you get to Widener? I mean, you were at Chichester. You went to Widener. I mean, you could have gone other places. Why, why Widener? Well, I wouldn't say that because uh, Joe Paterno turned me down because Ooh, of my size. Days. I mean, I, and I probably could have gone other places, but when you sat down in front of Coach, at least when I sat down, I'll never forget Arthur and I, Arthur uh, Henry and I, we did it, who went to Cheney, had a great career there. Uh, we were thinking we are going to play together wherever we went. But just talking to Coach Manlove and just seeing the sincerity, the, uh, sincerity and him telling us about the history of PMC at that time, which wasn't too good, <laughs> which wasn't too good. But he said, I could probably do it, you know, play two sports. And that's what I wanted to do was football and track and and possibly basketball, but those two I wanted to do. And he said, hey, you take care of your responsibilities in the classroom and everything else. And I'm not going to stop you from running track or playing baseball, nice. whatever you wanted to do. Nice. But it was just his genuineness that uh, you see coming through when you're speaking to Coach Manlow. And that's why I went. Now, I, I had other... I could have gone to other D1 schools, believe me. I know two for sure, but uh, <laughs> too far away. <laughs> too far and you, away. And you crushed it. I mean, I 
going to Widener, I had an opportunity to follow records and take a look at who did what. I believe you were averaging like 40 yards per kick return, 20 yards per punt return for for rush. I mean, they were crazy numbers, right? Yeah, they were, but it was it, it was like really it was a team effort because everybody got together. And and it's like I was when I was playing with the Oilers and, and, and the Falcons. Everybody had a part to do. I mean, you look at the offense, and I always remember Fuddy Fernandez coming to always lead me. Judge on the Fernandez. Yeah, yeah, Judge. <laughs> yeah, Fastino, Fina, Fina Fastino. Uh, coming around the end, I remember him. I remember uh, uh, Joe Fields, you know, him and Fuddy always working together, talking out there. You know, I remember the defense, Larry McGuire and Bert Ward and, and Michael Anderson, who was a heat-seeking missile. Those those things is, is, is what made it fun offensively defensively it's just and we competed against each other in practice it was the best thing I think that's why when I look at those that yardage I felt as if I can beat our defense on our level or have a good game against them not a superior game then I could play against anybody else on that league in that level and do well I want to ask you when did you know that you can go to the next level when did you believe that you were NFL ready? Oh, the time I came out of my mother's womb. Mm. I was that <laughs> <laughs> I wish I do. Hey, you know. That was good. That was good. That was good. <laughs> oh, I believe oh, it was not oh, in my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, it was one of those things that knowing that uh, competition, and, and, you know, as athletes, we thrive on competition. I, was, I always thought that if given a good opportunity, a, a legitimate opportunity, I might have a chance to play on the next level. When, especially when you saw Nolan Ryan, Flea, and all these other guys playing, it was just an opportunity to be in the right spot at the right time, given a right opportunity that the other guys would get. And I just, hey, so that's why I said I had nothing to lose. When I went up there, I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. People oh, didn't man. expect me to go that far, so. There was a question in the chat room similar to the previous question, but let's reframe. It says, what was your mindset from going to a small college to playing and being a force in the NFL? Where did you get that mental strength, that mental toughness? Oh, coming from a family of nine is going to give you the mental toughness. <laughs> <laughs> That's no problem. Uh, it was just a matter of uh, being around the right people. Mm. I had a track coach along with uh, – uh, uh, Coach Manlove, uh, who, who I really think the world of, uh, really molded me as a as a young man, outside of my father. But I, I, I just think being around the right people, Bob Shout would always make sure that uh, he was my track coach in high school. But I just think being around positive people, uh, seeing positive things in your life. Yes, you're gonna. All, we're all gonna struggle somewhere along the line, but never. Uh, allowing it to uh, get the best of you and having people tell you, well, you may get an opportunity. And especially uh, the next level was, hey, that's a pie in the sky kind of a deal. But if that's your dream, go for it. Let nothing stop you from 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 seeking that. And that's what I, uh, and it happened to me. I was always around the right people. And we would talk and joke about, hey, if I got to the NFL, if I got to the next level, this is what we do. And everybody does that. Uh, but it came to fruition for me, and I just tried to take the best of it. And the best thing at that time was I didn't I didn't worry. I want to give it the best I got, if that's all that I have, and you don't want it, they didn't want it, then so be it. Move forward. Yeah. But I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. You talk about, look what a segue. You talk about being at the right place at the right time. See if you remember this particular play with you being at the right play, right place at the right time. Call it the Hail Mary. Let's take a look. So now they've got to go to the end zone with two seconds left. Are we talking Hail Mary or are we talking uh, reception and lateral? I would say right here you've got to go to Billy White Shoes and let him do a little dance with the ball and try to go for the end zone. Here come the Falcons with Hodge, Bailey, and Johnson. All to the left side. Two seconds remain. 49ers will come with a three-man rush. Bartkowski to throw. He is going long down the near sideline. It's going to be a jump ball, and it is pulled down by Billy Johnson. Johnson inside the 10, 5. He is down. He is. Give it to him. He's in. Touchdown. Touchdown, Atlanta. Billy Johnson. <laughs> 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 
let me yeah. let me say I'm, this I'm, before I'm you ask that a little question. Bit. <laughs> before you ask the question, I was in. It was in. <laughs> what did the scoreboard say? That's there. That's there. Now on that play, it looked like you slipped, got up, caught the deflection, and took it in. You're exactly right, Doc. What happened was that play was designed for Stacy, who's tallest, who's taller than me, and taller than Floyd Hodge also was to go up. We're supposed to be in that little formation. They're supposed to tip it toward toward Floyd, uh, toward the inside. But what happened, Floyd, uh, Stacy went up, and the ball was short, and the hit Floyd's knee. And he wasn't prepared for it, and I'm just following, and I'm just – I always, we just do that in practice anyway. And it fell right into my hands. And I said, well, shoot, I'm going to give these guys 10 opportunities to stop me if they want me to stop, not make a touchdown. And uh, I'm joking. <laughs> but but I got it. And, you know, you always taught. If, if things being equal and you got a little speed, you run the longest, make them take the longest pursuit mm -hmm. angle to get you. So I saw that and I was able to see, I forget who it was, one of the linebackers coming at me and made me cut back. And I just, you know, uh, the shortest distance between the uh, uh, point is a straight line. So I just went to toward the goal line. I was fortunate. I, I'm not going to lie to you. It was just one of those Hail Marys. Touchdown. Touchdown. I know you've been asked this question 3,000 times. So here's 3,001. For those <laughs> folks who don't know, how would you get the nickname White Shoes? Talk to us about the White Shoes. Where did that come from? It was a bet, right? It was a bet, a challenge, yeah. Uh, oh, boy, that always got me in trouble, too. <laughs> Taking a dare. <laughs> it was a dare to, to dye my shoes white. I didn't paint them. I dyed them. Had a great, great carpenter up the street from us. Excellent. So I had a pair of white shoes. Rydell at that time, you know, nice, nice. nice. nice shoes and stuff. And high, uh, high school, right? High, high school, yeah, high school. I did summer of uh, my junior year, sitting on the porch talking about quarterbacks and things like that. and. Uh, uh, just a side note, at that time, Jimmy Ray was quarterbacking for Notre Dame. I mean, for uh, Michigan State, who had a big win this week. And they had beaten Notre Dame, tied Notre Dame. And I said, man, I wanted to be like that. When I knew I was going to be a quarterback, this guy said, well, if you, if you think you're that good, hey, why don't you dye your shoes white? And at that time, Joe Namath, Joe Namath started wearing white shoes. And, you know, you're a little cocky. You, you don't want to back down from the challenge. So I said, okay. So I got my shoes dyed in white. Uh, had two pairs, as a matter of fact, a game pair and a practice pair, and went to camp. And uh, our, at that time, Coach Apicello, he didn't like that kind of stuff. He just like hard nosed football players. So we had a. He he called me over one time and said, "Hey, what's that? Talk about my shoes." I said, "Oh shoot, I didn't know what to think." He said, "Well." And the only thing I could say was it made me ran fat, made me run faster. And when I <laughs> when I said he didn't say nothing, he didn't say a word. So we had the scrimmage, I guess, the next day and the next afternoon. And I, I had a very good scrimmage. He never said another word about the shoes. And mm. uh we went to play a, a, a team that was the number one in our county defense, uh, Chester High. Yeah, I'm gonna mention Chester High's name. <laughs> uh, they had the number one defense at that time, and I scored like six touchdowns. And the newspaper, Ed Gephardt, gave me the name Billy White Shoes. That's how I got the name, nickname. I love it. I love it. I love it. Talk to us a little bit about time in the NFL. When you play this different from today's NFL, I believe, with all the rules and regulations and you can't touch, what was that like for you coming from a small school, your first camp, you're playing with the, these big grown men? Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that like just you playing in the NFL, when you when you made the big time, you man, sure. and hearing, you know, that's that's it's overwhelming at times. If, if you if, and if you're not careful, it, it can it can psych you out. Uh, but just playing against guys like Joe Namath, my first year I played against Joe Namath, had a good game and got a chance to talk to him. Um, playing against guys like Curly Kauf, who was Kansas City wow, Chiefs, and, wow. and 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 Willie Lanier. At that time, uh, uh, that whole um, Kansas City front four, and then go to Chicago. Uh, here, you know, the best thing for me was that hey, you enjoy it, take it for what it's worth. You know, don't 
you know, I, I wasn't ashamed to say, hey, man, I, I, I enjoyed your play. But what the best thing that happened for me was to have some veteran guys uh, take me under their wing. And, and, and I think that made a major difference in my life of the do's and don'ts. They say, hey, don't go with that guy. Be careful of this. They say, hey, you're here to play ball. Play ball. You'll have plenty of time to do whatever afterwards. And I think that has always stuck with me. Um, and it made a difference in my life. I've always worked. And they say, how'd you get here? You worked hard to get here. Continue to do it. And then later in my career, I met a guy, Tom Williams, who was a, probably the first African-American general manager in the AFL, Old American Football League. And he would uh, take us all under his wing and train us and run us and work us. And believe me, it enhanced my career big time. You spent some time in Canada. What was that like? Playing Wonderful. in a bigger field, freezing. <laughs> you better be in shape. <laughs> you better be in shape. But it's fun. I think if anybody at that time, you know, guys were going getting in contract disputes, you don't want to sit idly by. Go and play with a competition. There is some competition. Of course, it's not like the NFL, but you're still being active. And for me, it was fun. It was enjoyable. Met a lot of great people up there. Uh, you know, I'd do it again if you know if I ever had the opportunity. But it was just fun and just to play in another, uh, play the same game, but with a little variation of uh, variation of rules. Were, were there were the fans as crazy as we are here in the United States? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Be talking about that national pride with with uh, with uh, ball players coming from the United States going up there. They they gravitated toward us. But you know, like Saskatchewan, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Montreal, man, they love those teams up there. They were they're just as rabid about their teams up there as they are down here. Love it. I love it. Let's go back to the chat room. There's a question that says, what challenges did you have while playing in the NFL in the 70s as an African-American man, as well as being from a small school? So I guess they're looking at challenges yeah. you may have faced uh, related to size and race. Well, yeah. Well, well, well you got to remember now, early 70s when I started, I guess mid-70s, my size was, was always going to be a topic. The, the, the thing was happening with us was that as African-American players, we always pigeonhole. You can, be, you can be a specialist, but you couldn't be a possessive receiver. You can be a good running back, but you couldn't be a quarterback. You know, right. you could right. be a nice corner cornerback, defensive back, but you couldn't be a safety. They always had these, these uh, certain positions mapped out who should be playing what. And, you know, eventually you saw how it was beginning to be race with uh, uh, Doug Williams coming in and having a good time. Uh, Jefferson Street Joe, who Joe he didn't Gillian. have his problems. Yeah, yeah, who, you know, Pittsburgh. So those things were changing. And you had guys like Art Shell and uh, uh, Gene Upshaw making it a point. Guys, these guys from down there in little Texas somewhere uh, played at a small school. And they were making their voices be heard. John Mackey, look at those things. So it, it, it was a change. It was changing and evolving to, to get better down the road. And, you, and I seen it right there in my career, you know, uh, a black head coach uh, coming. Um, so you, you I really saw think. The evolution. You saw the evolution, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, I saw the evolution. I, you know, I really think Jim, one guy who should have been the first one, but never made no bones about it, was Jimmy Ray, who played in Michigan State. Wonderful offensive mind. Ask anybody in the game today, they'll tell you. The guys that he's groomed, the guys that he's trained. Uh, he Obviously, he was ready to be a head coach at that time. Sure, sure. But, you I know, thought, I thought but, Mar Marlon Briscoe, I thought he might, you know, wasn't he switched from quarterback to receiver for the Dolphins? He, as a matter of fact, he played with the Dolphins and then uh, uh, I think he ended up with the Broncos. But yeah, Marlon was a good Marlon, Marlon the magician. Yes. <laughs> but you yeah. see, and I yeah. got a chance to meet guys like that. And I still go back and hear them talk coming from the SWAC, things like that. You know, uh, not until, you know, that's one reason the, I think, historically black colleges are suffering in football. Not suffering, but the talent yeah. is there is because of the um, white schools coming, getting talented players. They didn't care what color you were. Eventually, they got smart and said, hey, the guy can play, he can play. And they started depleting the uh, 
ranks and fouls up the good players in the uh, HBCUs. Wow. Wow. What, what was that like playing at Widener? When I played late 70s, early 80s, our division was primarily white. Um, our team was primarily white. What was that like playing in Division Three as it relates to race? Yeah, well, it, it, it's it was. I'm sure they probably challenged Coach Mela because he had four blacks on the team and all the stars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure he got some dump because some pushback more than likely. And I laugh because there's only like four or five of us. We all started. We all did okay. And and you're looking at Franklin and Marshall, your Swarthmore, your Moravian, your uh, Dickinson, yeah, Moravian, <laughs> Muhlenberg, uh, Ursinus, uh, Gettysburg, Ursinus. <laughs> hey, you know, and I think they they tried that darn they couldn't get one. So, but but I mean, but I'm sure they they we were probably challenged on our grades and and how we get to school, private school stuff like that. But it wasn't about that. It was about that's what that's what those schools were made for. Guys getting them an opportunity to play something, to get a good education. Uh, and, you know, uh, it was a, you know, it was a challenge because, you know, going to predominantly a white school. Uh, Chichester was a little bit better. We had several blacks to go there. Uh, it was mixed. But you never thought of it. I mean, that's the thing about, glorious thing about athletics. You don't know. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, but you really don't know until you sit down and start talking. We even had a Black Student Union on our <laughs> campus, which, <laughs> you know, uh, it's just one of those things that uh, when you're playing athletics, you're involved in everything, you know, your social life, uh, academics, and uh, you just get the right people. Uh, and I just thought other campuses, that's a... Hey, if you didn't have any African American students on campus, that you know, then you're missing missing out on the boat, sure. missing the boat. Sure. You mentioned coach several times, Coach Bill Manlove. I played for him too, and phenomenal man, phenomenal coach. And when I graduated a few years ago with my my doctorate, he came to my graduation party. Mm. So he's mm. he's one hell of a guy. We have another comment in the chat room. Some of your teammates, former coach, it says, "Talk to us about Bum Phillips." And Earl Campbell, Skull, brother. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Bum was the epitome of a, of a coach that understood people. Mm. Uh, and he can get you to play. Uh, oh. He understood what it was, and he tried to find out what made a guy tick. Yeah. Uh, Try to put him in the right position to play. And just play. Do what you're supposed to do. Don't worry about the unnecessary things around you. Uh, and I think he made guys feel as though, okay, well, I'm going to get a chance to do what I want to do. And if it works, he'll let you do it. If not, you just got to do it his way. Nice. But he was just a coach's coach. He got to, like he said, now you're going to miss some, which he's missed some. He'll, he'll be, he would have told you that himself, but he's going to get more right than he is wrong. And that's what happened when Earl came. He realized that, shoot, man, I wrote his back many a game. So. <laughs> But it was good because uh, uh, he would run Earl and he would rest Earl. People didn't realize. Earl didn't take a lot of beatings in practice. Mm. He was resting. Uh, games, he said, that's what he's there for. But he kind of took care of, care of Earl in that way in regards. Um, and, and when Earl came, it was just different. The guys got together. Uh, but Earl was about business, too. Earl was one of those guys, <laughs> you know, they thought he was an old country boy, you know, slow talking and slow walking, but they're always about business. And they knew what he was there for. And that's what Bum said, hey, and those guys got together. That's where all that zone blocking come from. He just said, hey, get engaged in that contact and then let him pick sides. Let him do what he's got to do. <laughs> <laughs> and he did a lot. Did but it. I just think, uh, you know, Bum and, and to me, uh, some of the coaches I played with, Dan Henning was really, he resurrected my career when he came to, to Atlanta. Those two guys, uh, coaches for me, were uh, what coaches should be about. Get guys in position to play, do what they do best, uh, give them an opportunity to uh, contribute. Uh, and uh, I think Bum did that. Bum did it for me and did it for a bunch of others. And same thing with uh, Dan Henning. So I just 
thought with, with especially in the, with the Oilers, when they all got there, man, I don't know what happened. It just changed. Everybody said, hey, because here he is. Hey, he's a, hey, he is an icon in Texas, believe me. They Tyler Rose. And everybody seen him got together. They, they saw he was for real. Uh, you, know, you see him, University of Texas, oh, he can run. But he was tough. He was in every way of the word tough, mentally tough, physically tough, and smart. Speaking of tough, at 5'9", they said 179, 175. What type of um, injuries did you uh, suffer during that 14, 15 year career? I, I, I had three, but you know, I wasn't 179 or 175. I was <laughs> probably 10 pounds lighter than whatever I recorded. But uh, I had three knee surgeries and, and, and you know, you're gonna get your bumps and bruises. You play at least three years in this league and you're gonna have some bumps and bruises. I was fortunate enough to, when I sustained those injuries, to find uh, uh, a good doctor, no, a great doctor at that time, Dr. Jack Houston, uh, down in Columbus, Georgia which made it tough for me and having people to work with me, our trainers and, and our staff, and of course, Tom Williams to help me get back. Uh, it, it was one of those things that when it happens and you've never been injured before, now you're talking about being bonkers. I was a little goofy there. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know because you didn't, you've never really been injured. And uh, they said, just go slow and Dr. Houston advised me. And all well, that whole staff, the whole medical team at that time just said, Yes, you can come back from it. Come back. And thank goodness I was a track runner, and and because I sure didn't lift any weights at that time. <laughs> so I showed it, and 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 and. But it was me, and and the injuries that I sustained were ones that you don't want to, you know, an ACL and a, uh, uh, I had a ACL and uh, on one knee and tore. I had yeah ACL medial collateral on one knee. Um, and then I tore all ligaments in my right knee and dislocated the kneecap and tore a hamstring mm. and then came back and did it again twice. So, I, you know, when you get to that level, you just say, hey, you, you just want to play. You, do, you just, first of all, you want to walk. Walk a natural, be able to walk naturally when you're finished playing. And uh, I was fortunate. God had blessed me and gave me the opportunity to go back and play again. Uh, and it's just like uh, a challenge all over again. There we go. Here we go. And in spite of the knee surgeries, you still did the funky chicken. Where did that come from? That end zone celebration where you got those legs moving. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't know if you knew this, though, Doc. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, during my time at Widener, uh, during the all season, I would write songs. I was a composer. Oh. And I, was, I was a musician. And I was a pretty good, you know, a, a dancer. So uh, I'm lying all about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't know if I could get Billy, you. Billy in the white <laughs> shoes, right? Yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> no, no I, that started because it was uh, once again another day at Widener, fooling with them crazy guys at Widener, uh, uh, saying we we're going to go and, and beat this team. And I said, if we if I if we scored and if I scored, I was going to dance. And you know we got we were all geeked up because this team thought they were a little bit better than they were, that they were going to kick our butts basically. So. <laughs> And you know how when you say something to the guys in the locker room, they're going to hold your feet to the fire. And I said, man, when I scored, I knew exactly if I didn't do it, I would have been a chump. So I had to, I had to uh, uh, keep my word, and I started dancing. And that's how I started. And it was, it was a uh, funky chicken because of Rufus Thomas. That's the only thing I could think about. <laughs> now you are brave because your first TD on the end around was against the Steelers. Yeah. And you did the funky chicken against the Steelers. What? And, and you know I wasn't thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they went all over the Super Bowl that year, I think. You know I wasn't thinking. I just, mm. it just so happened. And the moment that I finished doing it, I said, oh, shucks. That's the biggest hot dog move ever. <laughs> and I go over and I ask Bum about that. You know, what, what do you think of it? He said, well, shoot. That's what it's going to take to get you in the end zone. I hope to see more of it. He's the only coach I talked to and asked about that. I was scared to ask anybody else. Now, you're, prob was... you're probably the only NFL veteran that people see on the street and ask you to teach them how to dance. We got some footage of you showing people how to do 
the phone. Here, and you are the originator of the intro dance. So we were wondering if you could teach Bob and I how to do it right. Guys, you ready? I'm ready. You look like you got a little bit of athleticism in there. A little something in there. Would you want to put your stand on the ball to feet and get athletic in this year? Get athletic in Alright. Let your hips play a little bit, you know. Alright. Oh, there you go. Put your hands over your head now. Hands over your head. Yeah. Bring your knees. Yeah. And then out. And then out. You got to have a little bit of sight. A little bit more There you go. That's it. Yeah. You got to do a little bit of it, too. Oh, man. They were, they, they were good guys. They really could do it and do it better than I at that time. That they were just fun. pretending they couldn't do it. No, it is fun. It is fun. They come up and ask that. Boy, and I tell you what, that's uh, that's one of those days that uh, you say, oh, man, I got to make sure I'm loose now. Because <laughs> if not, ooh, I don't split anymore. That's for sure. Fantastic. Look, question in the chat room, it says, was there any time in your career where you doubted yourself and thought failure was possible. If so, how did you get past that? Any doubt, any time in your career? And if you did, how did you get beyond that? And if you did not, what went into you maintaining that positive outlook? I wouldn't say doubt. I would say concern. Mm. And concerned about, am I going to get another chance? Am I going to... Uh, be able to run like I could before. Uh, those are the things that concern me, that, that you're concerned with. And then you say, well, it's out of your hands. And see, being a believer, a man of faith, you know, it was out of my hands. It was out of my hands. And I think that being the main reason that I was able to, to overcome some situations in my life, especially on the field, that it was, I couldn't do it by myself, uh, but it gave me enough strength to keep forging forward to look, try, you know, take it to the end, see what can happen. It doesn't happen. Hey, move on to something else. But I was, I was a ball player at that time and, and I'm going to be a ball player as long as I could. Right. But when that time comes, hopefully I would know it and I'll move forward. Don't just keep trying to be the dead horse. Uh, how, how, and that's, how, did you, how did you know that this was it? The time to take the white shoes off. How did you know? My wife told me. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, dear. Yes, dear. I, because, because I had another year in me. I really thought, and I was asked to come back for another year, for another year. And I said no. But you know, after a while, your body begins to say, hey, you got this far. You're fortunate to get this far. Uh, you're still good enough. I mean, you always say, am I still, can I still contribute? Yeah. And I could have with the right young people around me uh, and right people around. But it's just, it's just, you know, that's it. You know, did you miss it? Oh, you're going to miss the game days. You're going to miss, more importantly, the guys in the locker room. But it, it, for me, thank goodness, I've done something every offseason to, to get ready for this time in my life. So it wasn't. I wasn't frantic into making that change, going to another profession or going something different. I've done, every, I've always done something every off season uh, because I knew I couldn't play this game the rest of my life. And if anything, I would advise any of the young players today or anyone else is to get into different things on the off season that uh, you might fancy to see if you want to do that. I did a, uh, uh, one time a trainee, uh, I've almost mentioned a company <laughs> I was in a training. I was in a training program, buddy, and I said, "Boy, this is what I don't want to do. I couldn't wait for <laughs> for spring camp for camp to start." Right. But I learned a lot in that field. I learned an awful lot in that field, and I said, "Man, that's one thing I won't do again because I didn't. I enjoyed it, but it was just too much. It was over, and and, and for me, that's why I say uh, you will know when it's time. And hopefully, if you've had enough experience during the off season." You'll, you'll know, okay, I can move forward. And if given an opportunity to come back, that's more gravy for you, you know. That's more Love gravy. Uh, Love gravy. Yeah. You played some professional softball too, didn't you? Yeah. Now, that was just a lot of fun. That was nothing but old recreation ball. <laughs> Getting paid for it. So. <laughs> and it was fun. It was fun. It well, was you played shortstop, outfield. No, outfield, man. Man, when them boys hit that. 
<laughs> yeah, I stayed in the outfield. Where them boys hit that ball sometime, and sometimes we played on that uh, on that turf. Man, I ain't handling all that stuff. Shoot, that was that was hot. That was hot. But it was a lot of men. Some good guys today. Some of the oh man, some Philadelphia police. Ray Didiger was on the team. Let Ray you know. Ray Diddy. Okay, could he could yeah. he go? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ray was Ray was like the secret babe Ruth. I'll say that. So maybe wow. he'll vote for me when the Hall of Fame comes. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about that because that needs to happen. You are the only member of the 75th anniversary team, top 75 players in the NFL. Don't forget you're, the top 100, too, now. You're the only one that's yeah. not in the Hall of Fame. So we got to make that happen. Make that happen. There's a comment in the chat room that says, I have to leave the show for another meeting. Great show and guests. Thanks, Billy, for your humility, your positive energy, and great insights. Really cool to hear your perspective, your approach, and appreciation of coaches and others who had a positive impact on you, not to mention the stories you shared as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank stuff. you. Good stuff. Uh, we got a footage from one of the Hall of Fames you are in. Uh, I want the folks to take a look and see part of your induction speech, but you were inducted, I believe it was 2018, into the Philadelphia Sports Hall of Fame. Let's take a look at part of your speech. I'm wow. eager to introduce Billy White Shoes Johnson to you, and I know we're going to have a good time listening to him. Thank you, Pat. Good evening to all you fine people out here, out there in the audience. Let me say this, you know, I've been pretty fortunate over the years to have been uh, inducted to several Hall of Fames, but by far right now, this Hall of Fame probably means a great deal more to me than some of the others. And I'll tell you why. You're not going to beat any fan support in any sport, more than you'll get here. Philadelphia has the best fans in the world, believe me. The best fans. And I know you can't say a lot in three minutes, but I'm going to try. First of all, I want to really thank my partner for 40 something uh, odd years, a friend, a companion my wife, Barbara, and I um, <laughs> want to thank the rest of my family, and that family is my immediate family and the family from Widener and the family that I have in the community. They've often supported me, gave me, given me great encouragement over the years, and I really do appreciate that. But the thing that I, I, I want you to understand is that every athlete up here has that desire, that function, wanting to be the best. And it reminds me of a little saying that I was told years ago, good, better, best, never let it rest until your good becomes better and your better becomes the best. Mm, what was that? Like, oh, the tissue issue? What was that? <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> no. As you can tell, I was probably about 20 pounds heavier at that time because I was, which is, which is true. I never knew that, but I was taking some medication um, and it caused me to, my tear ducts to start leaking water. I'm joking about the tear ducts, but no, <laughs> but I was taking medication for real. I really was. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what's going on. I have some inflammation. But uh, no, that was uh, that was a good time. That was really a good time, and and you don't think about it, but but uh, when you go to events like that, and people support not only me but other athletes in the area, uh, that's what we do it for to bring pleasure, uh, joy to others' lives. Because we're we're having it. We're living a dream that others yes. dream about. So why not be, you know, if you can, if you can bring happiness, uh, a ray of sunshine in some other's lives, why not do that? Uh, that's, that's the easiest thing for me to do instead of being a knothead and, you know, walking away from people. I don't want to be around you. I don't want to talk to you. So, so when you're honored like that, it, 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 it does mean something to each individual, if truth be told. Fantastic. 
uh, question in the chat room. It's pertaining to something that's happening today. It says the Eagles Lane Johnson has come out to say he's been dealing with depression and anxiety since college. Did you see any of this when you played? Oh heck yeah! <laughs> any, oh heck yeah! You see any of I you get thoughts on having mental wellness as yeah. a pro athlete at the pro at the pro athlete level. Well. It, it, I, I look at it like this now. There's nothing new today. It's like Ecclesiastes, you know, ain't nothing new under the sun today. You know what I mean? So at that time, people didn't know how to do it. Uh, I mean, even today, they don't know how to really handle it. But I do think now with, the, with issues, people can come out, feel comfortable about talking, anxiety. And, and I think what happened when we played, they always would gravitate towards someone who or, or a group of guys that would support them. Man, we're here with you. We're going to bring you through this. I, I've seen guys say, man, I don't want to play today. I'm looking at them, what? You don't want to play today? Come on. <laughs> and they said, I, there's something about it. You, you wouldn't understand. And I didn't understand at that time. I said, okay, that's, you know. Uh, but I can depend on you, right? And that's the only thing that happens. Wow. But when you know it going in and beforehand, you know the guy is suffering, you can cover for him. Uh, and then he goes talk. But now, because I don't think anybody understood, the, under really understood at that time or today, the pressure these guys are under, for making money, providing for their families. Uh, and I think the biggest thing is, is what people say about them, what they're, what they're going to be thought of, how they're going to be thought of. Uh, you know, and that's hard for some people. You know, growing up, when you come up from a, in, in, in a good family, but who, hey, you're just one of them, you're going to have to have a thick skin. <laughs> and so many guys, you know, they were all often, um, as they say, praised. They were often upheld. And they're not used to people saying this about them and yeah. that about them. They don't know how to handle it. But I find, look at the guys who say, so what? They ain't going to have no problem because they were challenged throughout their life. It's some, some of those guys who had a nice, I'm not going to say cushy life, but who never really suffered any challenges in people maligning their, uh, who they are, what they've done, what they've accomplished. But I do think it's, it's real. And the sooner they can get somebody to, to talk about it, because, uh, I mean, we've had plenty of guys go and see doctors or people uh, who can bring them through that depression what it sure. is, I guess, sure. uh, to the next level. Uh, when I was in Houston, we've had several guys that had that type of situation. What would you, how would you compare the NFL when you played to the NFL today? I mean, there's so much happening outside of football. I mean, outside of the field, you have the John Gruden episode. You have the uh, players who have admitted they're gay. Um, there, there's so much happening now. How would that compare to? You know, I, you know, I think then, you know, that was supposed to be a man's game, this or that. But you had the same issues then you have today. Same issues. People are just a lot more vocal today. And, and they're technology, finding... With technology, yeah. With technology and finding uh, formats uh, to different ways to speak about it. You know, I, I think when you're addressing issues... And it's the right way. People will listen to you. Take your celebrity status and use it in a positive way. That's what that's what I'm saying. So some of these guys who who who, who look at today's situations in, in the world situation and in, in the athletics, you know, they're speaking because they, they're out of concern. They want to see it different. They want to they want to help people. For the most part, you got some idiots and who don't know what they're what time of day it is right. uh, who are spouting off don't really know but I have no qualms in people speaking trying to enlighten people what's going on but also trying to make a change for the better uh, I have no problem with that at all but the bottom line for me as an ad football player that's my job and what I do on that field is, is, is how I get paid and that's what I'm going to do you mentioned you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not messing 
And that's the major issue with, with us in those days it is today is the monetary rewards. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned getting paid. How much money would you have been paid if you were allowed to sell your likeness when you were at Widener compared to what's happening now with college players able to sell their likenesses? About the same. <laughs> At a Division three school doc, it wasn't going to change that much. <laughs> About the same, you know, unless I got so, because these guys are so savvy now, they go and get these uh, these agents uh, to, to go and represent them. Go and represent them. Man, look, hey, I, I'm just, I was, didn't take much to make me happy. It still does it. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't have a clue. You went on to do some coaching after your playing days were. What was that like? Coaching the younger men, building their self esteem, getting them ready to hit the field and hit life. You know that it's, it's very similar to what you do, a, a, a coach. A coach can be that guiding light, or it can be the one that turns you know turns a young man's life completely off. Uh, I find that the coaches that I had in my life were very instrumental in, in making a difference in who I was off the field and on the field. Coach Manlow was that type of coach for me, made a difference. I mean, on and off the field. Bob Shout made a difference, uh, getting me mentally tough, uh, preparing, saying nobody owes you nothing, that kind of a deal. Um, my father, you know, just say, hey, you got to treat people the way you want to be treated. You know, nobody owes you nothing. You got to work hard. And if they don't give you your compliments, hey, it's no different. You're doing the same job you're doing. You're getting uh, uh, paid to do with your job. So, but I, I you know, I just find that uh, coaching young men and young women is about encouraging them, uh, being that source of uh, information for them at times, being able to read that person to find out what makes them tick, as they say. That's important. But also letting them know there's life to more than just the athletics at that time. Let's, let's, let's uh, go, stay with that, Billy. Let's stay with that. Yeah. What did playing in the league teach you about life? Lessons that you now <laughs> yeah. utilize each and every day. One thing it taught me was you may work as hard, the hardest worker out there, overtime, preparing, things like that. And you may not get the credit that you rightfully deserve. You may not get the notice recognition that you want to receive, although you know you've done it. But you're not going to stop working because the moment you stop working and thinking people still expect, I mean, you expect something from them, that's when your stock will fall down. But that's when you lose focus. To me, it taught me that, you know, you're going to have all these uh minor obstacles to overcome, but they're only going to prepare you to get you stronger mm. down the road. It's just like uh, the Bible says, you know, when these little challenges come up and God allows them to help you help uh, in your life and God allows them, and he knows what's going on. It just makes you a better person in the end because you're stronger. You know how to deal with it. You're going to help other people, but he's never, he never left you. So that's the same thing way I feel. Some of these things that we're taught, that we're up against in life, you're going to learn from them, and you're going to be able to help others. Are those some of the words you shared with the guys you coach? The oh, yeah. Future, oh, the, yeah. The, the future Billy White Shoes Johnsons? Well, well, yeah. The future fake ones, yeah. Because <laughs> they're all better than I was. And some of these kids are unbelievable. You know, in high school, well, in college, basically, when I was. Uh, and, 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 and you want to bridge that relationship that for life, especially on a collegiate level. Guys can come back, coach, remember this, remember that. And there's nothing, to me, a, a true coach, like a man love or a Bob Shout or, or, or guys of that nature, or Henning or, or Jimmy Ray, for instance, these guys touched you in a way that made you uh, appreciate them being in your life to make you to make you want to have success or to make you, whether you have success or not, you're going to continue to work. You're not taking anything for granted. You're not just uh, going through the motions, but you want to be, do something that is meaningful 
to you and to others. And as a family man, that's what you want, mm. you know. Uh, you know, and, and that tape that played, I talk about my partner, that was the wrong term, my wife, you know, and I, I said that jokingly, but, she, and you know she let me have it, but that is a relationship that, you know, we are, <clears throat> I can say, we work together. She has been very instrumental. And any man that tells you that has been married for over 45, 46, 47 years will tell you it's work. And you, you, you grow together, you learn together. And that's what you do with these young men, these young women that you coach. You want to be that guiding force in their lives, that ray of sunshine that they can say, oh, I know coach, I can talk to him. He ain't gonna judge me. He, you know, he's only going to tell me the truth, but he's going to be there to help support me. Love it, love it. Now, you played for the Falcons. I wish you would have played for the other birds, the Eagles, but that's another <laughs> story for another day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, in, in the, well in the chat, I'm sorry, go ahead. Good. Well, well, one bird I knew I was going to play. The other one was just a supposition, and they might not have panned out the way I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened was supposed to happen. So aside from yourself, who do you think are the best punt returners? The debate is between Primetime and Devin Hester. What do you think? They're very, they're almost similar. Mm. They're almost similar. Uh, uh, because they're both from Florida Metcalf State, too. of course. And they're big guys. Yet, well, see, I, I go back and I remember Terry Metcalf. I remember Greg Pruitt. Yes. I remember yes. uh, 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 guys like that. Uh, uh, Rick Upchurch, <laughs> mm, yeah, yep. you know, you go back and, and then you got some of the other ones now that are pretty Mel Gray. You look at these guys, it, it's, it's hard to say it's all regional. Let me put it this way. It's all regional. <laughs> whomever the best is. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Billy, in case people join late and they did not get a chance to see you in action, let's begin to bring this interview to a close by showing one more time you doing what you did. Let's take a look. Okay. What's next? What's next for Billy Weiss Hughes Johnson? Well, man, I, hey, uh, I'm not fading into the sunset, that's for sure. <laughs> I tell you that. Um, you, you know, life is good. You know, you got grandchildren, we got children now. Grandchildren is, 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 is a delight for us. Although we're not going to be the grand kid, grandparents that takes all the grandchildren. No. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to help. We're going to help them. We're going to help raise them just like our grandparents raised us. But we're just going to enjoy our life now. Uh, my wife is a teaching leader for Bible Study Fellowship. I'm a group leader for Bible Study Fellowship. Uh, I still coach. I still am involved in athletics um, around town and, and uh, still do a, speak from time to time. But uh, we're going to enjoy life, continue enjoying. Put it this way, we're going to continue to enjoy life. <laughs> Soon to be Hall of Famer, we'll see to that. Billy? Weishu's Johnson, Widener alum, Chichester alum. Thank you for um, joining us today. It was a treat. Christmas in November. It was a treat. Really <laughs> appreciate oh, you being here. And for those of you who come every week or came for the first time, thank you. Bring someone with you next week. Again, these shows are informational and transformational, and we have a good time. And don't forget, like I always say, 
You've just been gym packed. Take care.